we gather to sing all his praises we gather to worship the king we gather to hear of his precious love his grace and to all lives he Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to look at uh, a little special letter over in the New Testament, and uh, we're going to give you that uh, book in just a moment. But we're going to look at the whole book today, and uh, you'll say, well, preacher, we'll never get through all that. But we will, and we'll get through it today and see the little lesson that God, not a little lesson, little book or letter, but a tremendous lesson for us all to follow. Um, in the beginning here, in our introduction, though, it is um, it is a Memorial Day weekend, and in our church here, we have already had a time of remembrance, and we've shared, and we certainly shared a song of patriotism this morning, and we certainly wanted to recognize and have on this Memorial Day weekend, when many have uh, some confusion over what this is and the distinctness of this special, special day is that it is certainly uh, in remembrance of those in our country who have given the ultimate sacrifice for us. And for that, we have the liberty to worship in this nation. And we're certainly grateful for that. So our wishes to you on Memorial Day, but some of you will be seeing this at other times, but this is Memorial Day. And uh, our church certainly believes uh, in a strong faithfulness and worship of God, but we want to be our best in America, and we don't want to be ungrateful. So we're very grateful for the freedom we have. And on this Memorial Day, remember those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for allowing us to be able to share the freedoms that we have in this country. If you will now, take a time and turn to Philemon. Philemon. A little, uh, a little letter from Paul, and I say the word le a little again, and it's not that long, but it's rich. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's so practical. Paul writes a letter from his heart to help a situation. He looks out in the love and mercy, really, that God has placed into his heart. And I think it would be fitting to add the word grace there. And he pins these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And in practical words, he's pinning them to help a situation. He wants to see something reconciled, a situation reconciled. He's not pointing blame, but he's teaching on forgiveness and reconciliation. I hope today as I prepare and God has spoken to me, to be able to share this in a way that will be presented so that you know there's, there's need for this. There's so much unforgiveness. There's so many things that just don't want, you just don't want to get it reconciled. You don't want to work it out. You leave things unended within the church, within the body of Christ. Paul in this situation saw something that needed to have a spiritual conclusion. As we share this today, it's one that people would say, your preacher preached on what? You're, now they would know forgiveness and reconciliation, but your preacher took the whole book of what? I don't even know where that is. <laughs> you know, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, 1st, 2nd, uh, where do, I, don't, I don't know where that goes. And I promise you, I don't mean that negative. But it's nestled in there. But we miss the wonderful truth that this letter of testimony shares. Some, 
And we have done that. So I encourage you on your own this week, those of you that are watching and have joined us today, read again this whole letter in its entirety and see this and let it and, and, and take it and devour it and see what the servant here is sharing. But in just a few minutes, I want to give you an overview of this letter today and be sharing in the idea of forgiveness and reconciliation. It speaks to that. And I pray that it will be a vessel used today for his glory. Let's share a prayer together. Father God, bless now the reading of your word. Bless this time. Let us not take it for granted. Lord, we want to hear from you. And Lord, the things that you've even given me, Lord, let me share those in a good way to be a blessing. And Lord, it's some, some things that people may be walking through in the, in the areas of forgiveness and unforgiveness. Lord, I pray that you'll speak to hearts today, those that are within our fellowship, within our family here, and those that are watching today. I pray that you'll speak to them. It may be something they're walking through in the idea of unforgiveness. I pray it may speak and there'll be decisions made. Again, bless the reading of your word, and thank you again for the freedom that we have to stand in this pulpit today and to share your blessed word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Here we see Philemon. We want to read the passage now. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Achippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. For love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although I in Christ, I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless, to you, but now he has become useful to both you and to me. I am sending him who is very who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so they could take your place in helping me while I'm in change for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you would do not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dear to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing. Prepare a guest for me, because I hope to be restored to you to answer in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Now many believers may 
have never just taken the time and read through this letter in its entirety. Now, we've heard verses. We've heard teachings to say, Paul, let's look at the letters of Paul and see how he always did greetings. And we would go through and see, I greet you in this, and this was this, and somewhere in there, there was that funny name. I remember growing up and then early in the ministry, as I've shared with you, God called uh, me into the ministry when I was 16, and I was able to be in a lot of different style opportunities of worship and churches, and I would be somewhere where we'd get to this particular letter, and I, I maybe you've heard a lot of messages out of Philemon. Most would say probably not, but I remember some of the various places I would be, and I remember some that would get up and read it, and... Uh, without a critical spirit here, as even Paul said in this letter, I'm not being it, but it was uh, a little funny to me as a young minister. I pretty well tried to work on getting the name right. Philemon. Philemon. Now check it today, and if you want to go to that wonderful word Google, check it and divide it, the syllables, but it's Philemon. Now, some would look at me in a lot of settings and go, Preacher, oh no, now that's Philemon. That's Philemon. And evangelist we had one time was excited. We'd done the great thing of having an outside meeting, and he crossed over forgiveness. He went right to Philman. Most of us are thinking, Where, where's Philman? But it's Philemon, okay? Some would even say that. That's not being critical this morning, but you would look at that. Some would even say Philemon. I've heard that before. Maybe you've heard that. But the, the proper pronunciation of this individual as we see it, Philemon, Philemon. And so when you look at this, what? We've looked at that. Here is that little small book that's over there somewhere around Revelation and somewhere, you know, probably right after Acts, I guess. But it is a letter still as Paul put together. We believe in the complete inspiration of God's Word. Paul said that he wrote this with a purpose. The Holy Spirit that empowered Paul put these words together and he penned them to address the situation that these individuals had faced. Forgiveness and reconciliation is its thing. Paul wrote this letter, as you probably now have figured out. Paul wrote this letter from prison. He wrote this letter from prison. He wanted to write this letter to persuade Philemon to basically welcome back. Here's another word that you've heard all kind of ways. But that word, as I see it, is Onesimus. Onesimus. Now this Onesimus was a slave in that day to Philemon. What we see had occurred or what we feel like we don't really see in this but we know that there was a breaking point but yet in that process Paul now saw him in a different place Paul addressed this situation and said I'm writing to you about this and I'm an old man and also a prisoner I'm appealing to you now what's the word he used I'm appealing you to you for my son, Onesimus. Onesimus was now a believer. He was a Christian. The wonderful warrior for Christ, Paul, in a very troubled time in his life, is addressing a life situation here. He sees the need, and he wants to see this dear servant restored. And he deals with a tough area, forgiveness and reconciliation. Matter of fact, Paul said, and we'll get to it in a moment, he said, well, I want you to forgive him, and I want you to welcome him back in just as if it was me. Now really think about that. Do you think of the rapport that Paul... Now, he wasn't about himself, remember. Paul said he died every day. I can only do the things because Christ strengthens me. 
I get up every day and I die daily. Paul's not about lifting himself up. But you can imagine in all the letters of the respect that the people in the churches had for Paul. And Paul says to this servant, you take him back in just like he's me. Could you imagine him thinking, Philemon is thinking, whoa. Now, whoa, well, wait a minute. You don't really know what all was happening. You don't all know all that had occurred. But yet what Paul addresses here is, he is now a servant with me. His life has been changed. And guess what? He's now a brother. He's my brother, and he's your brother. Don't miss that. When Paul shares this, he gives this to persuade Philemon to welcome him, to restore, to reconcile. A word we could not go through these verses and not share. And at the very end of it, I'm going to read it again, the end of this letter. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Folks, this type process, many times, is not what we want. If it's within our flesh, we put restrictions with it. If it's this, we don't cross the economic lines. We don't cross the things that challenge us in our flesh. But the Word of God makes no division with that. The Word of God says we forgive and we reconcile. And the Word at the end there, don't miss it. We all talk about amazing grace, how sweet the sound, and the grace that brought me and saved me. Uh, what about the grace that teaches us to forgive? Oh, no, whoa, 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 preacher. Whoa, no, wait a minute. That person is over there, and they've got money for this reason, and they're over here in this reason. And you remember now, we don't cross that. You say, preacher, that's silly sounding. It may be. You put whatever words you want to in the time period that we're in, whether it's now or years ago, but the grace of God sees no economic division. It sees no re racial barriers. It's the grace of God that covers. Paul said at the end of that, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. There's a reason he said that. Because sometimes it's not our desire within this flesh to forgive and reconcile. It has to be what God shows us. Notice Paul said, in the middle part of that area, he said, I'm going to make an appeal to you on the basis of love. Don't miss that. That's why many times, we, oh, you, you're coming to me, and we're coming up with this higher attitude towards some situations. We've got to pray through those things. He said, I'm appealing to you in a spirit of love, where the love that Jesus taught him. You remember, he had a hate for, for God. He had a hate for Jesus. We talked about that here in these services. The very fervor that he wanted to do to, 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 to destroy all about Christ, that same feeling and emotion and love was now turned toward Christ. He said, I am appealing to you on the basis of love. I love you. God loves you. Our Savior that we serve loves you. I'm appealing to you on the basis of love. In this little letter, and again, letter little by size, not by message. We see a couple divisions I want to give you in closing. Number one, we see a thought of appreciation here. What's Paul do? Right at the very first, Paul gives appreciation. Verses 1 to 3, he said, Paul a prisoner and Timothy our brother, to Philemon, watch, our dear friend, our fellow worker. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He showed love that to him. He appreciated the love and, and, and the cooperation there. He also shared forgiveness in verse 4 and 5. He said, I also thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. 
Verse 4 and 5 there. If you're taking notes, he's appreciative for, or he shows his love. Paul also expresses his thanksgiving. And number 3, in verse 6, he says, I pray. You want to make a little note there? That's Paul's prayer. He prayed that your, he says, I pray that your partnership with us is in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share. We're all in this together, he said. I pray for you, and I pray that your ministry is there for the real reason, for the right reason. That is effective for the glory of God. In this letter, not only do you see Paul's appreciation, and he directs this at Philemon. He makes an appeal. He makes the appeal, and the appeal's in verses 8 to 16. Some Bibles, as a commentary word or a word of there, when you read them, would say Paul's plea. But let's say his appeal today for sake of outline. Paul's appreciation is shown. Now Paul's appeal is given. Verses 8 to 16. Verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 and 9, he talks about the character of Philemon. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you, order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. And he says, It is none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He relates to his character there. He knew that Philemon was a good man. I am coming to you. You're a good man. You're, you're profitable for the ministry. I'm coming to you asking this. Oh, I could order it, but I'm doing it out of love. I'm making this appeal. Verse 10 to 14 talks about the conversion of Onesimus. That I appeal to you, now what's the phrase? My son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Man, isn't that, isn't that wonderful? To know he trusted Christ. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and me. Have you, have you, ever, have you ever prayed in your life through a situation like that? Maybe you were a, maybe it was related to work, maybe it was related to family, maybe it was related to whatever, you know, the journey God's brought you through. And you might have gone into the depths of a comment and said something similar to this and reversed it to go, man, that person's useless. Man, that's just useless. Man, he needs to pick it up. Now, I'm not talking about work job performance. Y'all know that. But when we're looking at this, he says, formerly he was useless to you. What changed? What changed? He had become a Christian. Paul had seen some things in his life. I am sending him back for you for reconciliation. Whatever it might have been with their relationship. But now he has become, watch this, useful to you. And useful to me. He'd been there. He'd been there doing things with Paul, probably. Probably being along to know there, to know, hey, maybe hungry for the word, maybe. But Paul said he was useful to you, for me, and useful for you. And we see this. I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. That's a strong statement, isn't it? Have you ever read that in that passage before? I am sending him who is my very heart back to you for reconciliation. Watch this. I would have liked to keep him with me. That's saying, hey, he's doing something, isn't he? Do you agree with me on that? I hope you do. Check it out. He's saying, I would rather have him here, but I'm sending you so he could take your place in helping me while I'm in the change for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything, watch. Paul, even in the Christian faith, which is a missing thing today, he followed the Spirit of the Lord and he used spiritual discernment. Not, now I know, don't get mad at me this morning. Well, preacher, we just need to, that's okay. We're going to blast in like the deer, like the, Bull in a china shop. Now, if it's dealing with the things of what it should be biblically, and if it things of things of addressing sin, then yes. But so many times, that's just who I am, preacher. 
There are lives ruined and hurt within the church because we didn't practice what Paul said. Preacher, are you upset? That? No. I'm seeing that Paul said here, I would not do anything. Watch what he says. I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced. Now this is a story of forgiveness here. Each situation of those things, as you watch me today in this time, as the folks here in, my, in our church family, those have been different things that you could put a face to as God's brought you through your situation, maybe similar to this. But Paul said, I wanted to appeal to you in love. I'm appealing to you from prison about something that is important. I want restoration to be done. I want reconciliation to be done. I am saying this ought to be done. But he said, I didn't want to do anything that seemed to be forced. Now think about it just a minute. Back to a time maybe when you were in the community. Maybe you were a little boy or girl, young person in the community. And I was under this before, and I understand it. I probably practiced it as a parent. But when you bring together and you come out, and let's say you had good Sunday afternoon football somewhere in the community, and you wore the T-shirts and everything, and it was a good shirt, and then you get it and you come home and the shirt's ripped off, and you want to find out, well, I was in a fight. All right, come with me. You've been there, some of us. We go there, we get the person together. Now, y'all ask forgiveness, and they're still just mad and stomping. And, well, I'm going to ask forgiveness, but, but you know when they walk away, now, folks, listen to me. Some feel like after that forgiveness, they'd have been, they'd have been ready to call skunk face or something or something in it. I know that's not a, but I'm just saying my point, though, is in that to be forced, and we're taking it to a higher level. We're taking it to a spiritual level. Paul said, I am not bringing you together. Though by my authority in the faith, I could. You follow that? He could. But he said, I'm appealing to you to do something that is right in this. And that is to welcome him back, forgive him, and let's see a witness of reconciliation. Paul said that that would be such a positive testimony for the kingdom, for the family, to see this. And I believe that's true today, to see forgiveness and reconciliation in the family of God. What a testimony. Instead of, instead of so much division based on things that are purely of the devil many times. Let's see this. The providence of God is mentioned here. The providence of God is given. Let's look at verse 15. Providence of God, perhaps the reason he was separated for you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, whew, whew, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dear to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. That's forgiveness. He's teaching that. That's it. When he said that, he said, you might have him back. Watch this. Not just for the momentary times of where you're done or what the reason was before, but that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. God's providence. God's providence. God will provide. You say, I just don't know. I just can't preach her. All right, Brother Mike, you pray. But be careful when you pray. In this sense, we all should pray, right? But I said many weeks ago when we covered forgiveness here in, some ser in a sermon, when you do that, you be open because God will put a face to that sometimes. Say, oh, Brother, I don't know if I agree with that. It's under the blood. I understand that. But sometimes it may bring a face to go, I under the Lord, need to make that right. I need to go to that situation. Maybe a situation you remember. Maybe whatever. That's up to what God deals with you in your life. You be open to what God shares. But God will provide a way. 
He'll provide that way. And I'm going to tell you, we'll give enough excuses, and I'll tell you right away who's over there smiling and laughing. Y'all know. You say, well, we're not of the devil. We're not. But the devil is laughing and smiling every time you put those little excuses there. God's saying, you need to do this. God said, make this right. I'm so thankful for this testimony today that we see this letter that encourages us in this. And then the last thing, there's assurance. Verses 17. Let's go to verse 17. So that consider me a partner, welcome him back as you would welcome me. We've already shared that today and some thoughts about that. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, whatever it may be. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I minister to you. You trusted Christ. I was faithful. I am so glad that you were faithful. Is what he's sharing with him. He's saying that to him. You see partnership mentioned in these last verses, verses 17 to 25. You see partnership here. You see confidence here given. Confident of your obedience. Paul's saying, I know you're going to do the right thing. Have you ever been in that situation before? When you may have led into some uh, council times or working with another brother or sister, and you might have a phrase that God gave you, and you must just say, you pray to do what God, but I am confident you're going to do what Have you ever shared that? Have you ever maybe been like that and shared that? That's what Paul says here. He said, I'm giving you this instruction. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Hmm. <laughs> What's our, what's our flesh connection sometimes? Now, I didn't say we were not saved now, but what's our flesh reaction to most of those type things in our life? We do the minimum. We do the this and we do that. We get by. What's Paul said he did for I want you to do? He said, I hope you be restored. But the, right before that, I write to you knowing, confident, that you will do even more than I ask. Isn't that wonderful? He said, I'm, I'm sharing this tough situation to you. He's going to come to you, and you're going to do more than I ask, and I have confidence in you. A lot of times that's the thing we need in, in our spiritual walk. Maybe one that comes along and holds your hands up, or one comes along and gives some direction, but they might be with that idea of saying, well, you, you failed about four times, but try to get it right this time. Come on. Come on, folks, spiritually listen to me. It may be that you can come along with that prayer under the leading of the Holy Spirit and say, These are what this is what God's saying, and I am praying that you do right, and I know that you have the I know that you have the leading to do that. Might be surprised what we do if we follow what Paul said here. I know you're not gonna cut it short. I know you're not gonna take shortcuts. You're gonna do what God wants you to do, and you're even gonna do more. That's what he told them. And he gave a greeting. Isn't this an unusual kind of for a letter? He goes to the end here and gives a greeting in conclusion. He said, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. Watch these names now. Do you see me? And so do Mark. Wasn't Mark in a message? We shared Mark in a message the other couple of weeks, I think. Barnabas, remember? Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave a greeting at the end of his letter. He said, these workers are here. Well, let's finish this thing with grace. And you show grace in these dealings. Grace will move us to spiritual forgiveness and reconciliation. The grace of the Lord, the grace of God. Sad note in that last greeting, though. Did you see a name there? that a sad phrase is given to later in Paul's life. Demas has forsaken me. That's in another part. That's in another one of his closing words. Demas, for whatever reason, fell along the way. Mark had a, was involved, remember, in Barnabas with that division that happened. It might have been that Paul and Barnabas never restored. I believe they did. I don't believe it was like that. But now look. Look who's there, Mark. <laughs> hey, I see Mark came on through. I didn't see it at that. I mean, I, 
There were things that the Lord led me to do right there. But it didn't mean Mark was at service, did service for the kingdom. Mark is there in his closing time at that time. They're there with him. We're fellow workers. So today, as we learn this lesson today, from Philemon, in relationship to Onesimus, we see a letter encouraging us to not only say it, but to practice forgiveness and reconciliation. And as we walk this journey, we're faced with that. Let's make decisions that will bring glory to the Lord and not negative to the church. Because a lot of times those things bring negative vibes. But let's be positive. Let's be spiritual. And as we see these things, let's practice true forgiveness and reconciliation. That's what Paul taught in this letter. Practical letter addressing a situation. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the privilege to share today. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we will be people of forgiveness and people of reconciliation. Thank you for this wonderful letter that we have here. As Paul gives so many things that will help us in life situations. Lord, let us exhibit grace in our dealings. Lord, as we've gathered here today, I pray that you'll uh, touch lives. Lord, I pray decisions will make whatever they may be for salvation for you, for serving for you. But it may bring a situation up to them that they need to handle for his relationship to forgiveness and reconciliation. Speak to them. Allow us to be people that will not only just say words, but we will put those words in action. We love you, Lord. Today, we celebrate you. Allow us to be good servants for you as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.